Greetings, friends. Somewhere between black and white, there is that shade of gray. I'm Mark Gray, and welcome to today's edition of The Gray Area. Today's guest has always been a forward thinker, even from his days at the University of Maryland, where he led the charge for the name change of the college football stadium to becoming the youngest mayor in the history of the city of Greenbelt. 27-year-old Colin Bird is making changes and he joins us right now representing the millennial generation as a male and mayor bird thanks for taking the time to join us welcome to the gray area well thank you it's a pleasure pleasure to join you thank you so much all right right, now again to the point about you and forward thinking you're about police reform right now I don't sense that there's a great deal of contention in your community, but you would know better than I. Why is police reform, particularly in Greenbelt, so important to you? So, so I, I would say it's the same reason. Some, it's the same reason that it's important everywhere. Um, the reality is that while in Greenbelt we are not uh, Minneapolis or Louisville or Atlanta or Ferguson or even Baltimore. While we may not have such high profile cases or cases with the same level of severity and shock value, the reality is that there is really no police department in this country that is completely unblemished when it comes to race and misconduct in general, up to and including brutality and killing. And so um, with that in mind, I believe that in Greenbelt, as is the case anywhere, what we should be focusing on is making sure that we make the proper adjustments, not over adjustments, but proper adjustments to ensure uh, that our policing is as fair, transparent, just, and accountable as it possibly can be. Again, even if it's a good department or even a great department, we know that there's no such thing as a perfect department. And so every department uh, can make some improvements. So uh, I would say that the reason that it's important is because it's an issue. And as I've taken other issues very seriously, whether it was um, revamping our sexual harassment policy, um, making the city formally recognized Indigenous Peoples Day, um, uh, ending the police cooperation with ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, expanding our Black History Month programming, um, you know, what I'm going to be doing going forward, which is uh, introducing legislation to make Juneteenth a paid holiday. The reality is, if it's an issue, I want to address it as mayor of the city of Greenbelt. And and this is part and parcel to that. And last thing I would just say is we are in the midst of the biggest protest movement in American history, this Black Lives Matter movement. But we have to make sure that it's not just a a slogan, rather it is incorporated as a governing principle that applies to our policing laws, policies, and practices from top to bottom. I'm going to come back to that. But in staying with the police reform matter, Describe the relationship as you understand it between your community and your police force on a scale of five balls with one being the worst and five being the best. How many balls do you give that relationship? Well, you know, I don't want to be evasive, but I'm not going to necessarily put a a number on it because the reality is there are, there's there's no way to paint uh, the views of the public or even the police department itself with a broad brush. Uh, You know, as with any uh, department, whether it's a police department or any governmental entity or even private sector entity, there are, you know, folks who perform very, very well and there are folks who perhaps do not perform as well. And so I don't want to use a broad brush. I will say that there's some nuance in the views of the members of, of my community uh, and the members of the Greenbelt community on this issue. Um, there's a spectrum. Um, there are on one end people who think that the police can do no wrong. And on the other end, there are some people who think that the police can do no right. I think that most of us are somewhere in between, you know, and that varies, of course, within those extremes. And so, um, you know, from my perspective, that gives us room for improvement. Um, That also means that there is a a way for us to create legislation to make the situation better. And again, the idea of putting forward legislation is not in and of itself an indictment of every officer in the department, past, present, and future. It is simply uh, to put in place certain things in terms of accountability. We don't have murder laws because we think everybody's a murderer, but we do have murder laws because if you are one, we want to make sure that there's a way to uh, get justice as part of that. And so um, there are some other things outside of murder laws that we want on the books to try to make sure 
policing is fair, just, transparent, and accountable here in Greenbelt and statewide and across this country. Um, and that's what that's what um, that's what this is all about. So you do think that there's a little bit of room or some room to get better in those areas, certainly in terms of the relationship in the community and the department. Absolutely, and I and I would just say this, and I don't want to harp on every anecdote that I've ever received, but certainly certainly when I became mayor, and even when I was first elected to city council, I'm the second African American to ever be elected to the Greenbelt City Council. I'm also the second African American mayor of Greenbelt. The reality is. Perhaps there's a level of trust that people have with me because of the resume that you just mentioned in terms of some of the things that I've done in the past, um, as well as some of the things that I've done since I've come on the city council and since I took the position of mayor, that give people a level of comfort to come to me with these issues. And I can tell you that there are many people of color, in particular black males, who have come to me and, and let me know that there is quite a bit of room for improvement that we can make on this issue. Again, I've heard from other you know, groups of people where, you know, the issues for them may not seem as severe, but what we want is a department where in the end, there's no racial category or even gender slash racial category of people who feels like, uh, you know, the department isn't there for them uh, and, and is out to get them. Um, and I'm not saying that people feel that way in mass, but to the extent that we have individuals who have experiences that have led them to believe that or feel that way, we want to try to correct that going forward. You know, personally, how to affect change. You were a change agent at the University of Maryland. We mentioned that previously uh, in regards to the name change to what is now uh, Maryland Stadium at Capital One Field. What did you learn from that experience at Maryland in terms of how to build coalitions and how to move from protest and demonstration to, in this case, legislative policy change? Well, it's a good question. An even better question is what did I not learn? Because that was an extraordinarily fruitful experience in terms of learning. Um, you know, at the beginning, I didn't necessarily know everything I was getting myself into in terms of some of the opposition and some of the things that would come out of that. But I will say in general, I learned quite a bit about politics, about the levers of power uh, locally here in Prince George's County and around the state of Maryland. I learned a lot more about how racism works, how it performs and how it persists. I learned about race relations in general. I learned about how you know different groups of people can come together to either support or oppose some change, whether it's symbolic or um, substantive. I learned about you know how these debates can be very uh, nuanced, very complex, um, and and how these conversations about change can be very very um, difficult. Um, I also learned about how money factors into these things because there's a lot of money things when you start talking about stadiums in particular. Um, and, and I also learned quite a bit about how age factors into these things. There was a big generational divide, I think. You know, a lot of the younger white people attached to the university, for example, um, were more open to the change than some of the alumni that perhaps remember the good old days. Uh, and, and so, you know, that was, those were some of the things that I learned. And I would say probably the biggest thing that I learned was the way uh, different events sort of play into the conversations, the narratives around these things. So, like, Right now, one of the biggest reasons that we're talking about this is because of the whole situation in Minneapolis, Minnesota with George Floyd. We know that that was not the first incidence of police brutality in America, and it's far from the last, but we do know that in a very spectacular way, um, it galvanized a lot of people to finally take this issue on very, very seriously. Um, and again, it has, it has been a large part of what is now the biggest protest movement in um, American history. So the way events was, were affecting things back then was, if you recall, there were a lot of other universities that were going through similar conversations around race and in particular symbols, University of Texas, Washington and Lee, University of Missouri or Mizzou. They had those big protests where the president ended up having to resign because this guy did a hunger strike. Um, Princeton University, that was the first time they took a crack at the conversation around Woodrow Wilson. And of course, at that time, they did not rename. Um, and then even, you know, at the University of Kentucky, a lot of conversations. I also actually got to know some people that I never thought I would get to know, like the Mitchell family. Um, you know, and, you know, what one of the things that ended up happening even before they renamed the stadium that might not get that much attention is that they actually renamed one of the buildings on campus after Perrin Mitchell. So now on the University of Maryland's campus, they have a Perrin Mitchell building and a Clarence Mitchell building, which I'm sure Curly Bird would not have been too fond of. Um, and then again, just 
there were concurrent conversations going on nationally. You got to remember that same year was, was when they had the situation down in Charleston, South Carolina with Dylan Roof. And then they had the conversation about the Confederate flag. And even here in Maryland, we were having conversations about the Roger Taney statue in Annapolis. Of course, Mr. Taney being the chief justice who authored the infamous Dred Scott decision, uh, which said some very disparaging things about black people to say the very least, but certainly was, it goes down in history as a very, very problematic uh, aspect of judicial precedent that of course, at this point, we're fortunate not to have continue to be a law of the land. Now, can you share your thoughts as both an organizer and a legislator, if you will, right now, in terms of moving this Black Lives Matter movement from again, protest and demonstration to effective legislative policy changes. What planks in a platform do you feel are most important to advancing the ball, much like we saw with the Native Americans and the professional football franchises name change here in the DC area? Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up, you know, that because I one of the things I want to sort of start with is the fact that, you know, long before I was ever involved in politics, I was a big fan of basketball and football. And in particular, um, you know, I grew up playing basketball. And one of the things that you know is people talk a lot of trash on the court, but the reality is what matters is that performance. And so, you know, at a certain point, talk is, is good and we can talk about all of these issues as, as long as we want. But um, we got to turn all of that talk, we got to turn all of that anger into some action. We got to couple that anger, that outrage, that disappointment with some level of optimism and a commitment to working hard and focusing on trying to address these issues in a very substantive way beyond, you know, going, taking to the streets. That, that always has to have an end goal. Protest cannot be a, uh, an end uh, in and of itself. It has to be a means to an end, and that is change. So we want to take Black Lives Matter um, from, like I said earlier, from being a slogan, we want to operationalize that. And we want to make sure that Black Lives Matter ultimately becomes a governing principle. If you think back to the civil rights movement, um, one of the biggest things that most people remember about the civil rights movement is the uh, famous, I have a dream speech. But I have the I have a dream speech, and there were a lot of other things, but just to use as one example, the I have a dream speech, that was a, that was a message and he was talking about a very specific set of policies that flow from that dream. When he talked about little white girls and little black girls and little white boys and little black girls, what he was talking about was desegregation. What he was talking about was effectively what ended up being the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so what I think we need to do with this to make sure that Black Lives Matter goes from protest to policy is make sure we operation operationalize that on some level. We won't all agree, but there need to be some policy discussions that come out of this. So thus far, I know at the federal level, they're talking about the Justice and Policing Act. They're talking about the BREATHE Act, right? We have to make sure that in the end, if the answer is to, you know, in mass incarceration, to uh, reform policing, to uh, take a second look at how we treat our black and brown brothers when it comes to law enforcement, to demilitarize police departments, let's be specific about that. Let's be committed to that. Let's deal with use of force. Let's deal with transparency. Let's deal with accountability. Let's deal with how we go about investigating, disciplining, and ultimately terminating officers that engage in misconduct up to and including brutality uh, and in killing. Let's deal with qualified immunity, which uh, uh, is, is, a, is a legal doctrine that allows um, police officers to not be um, held civilly liable for violating the civil rights of uh, civilians. Let's deal with these issues. But again, um, protest is necessary. It is a prerequisite. We do need people out in the streets. We do need people voicing their concerns and petitioning government for redress of grievances. But let's focus on making sure that redress actually takes place rather than just focusing on talking. Do you think the movement would be best served? And I'm gonna bite off of Stephen A. Smith from ESPN who talked about a black political action committee. Do you think that there could be enough uh, black economic wealth to get behind the type of political leadership that could go onto Capitol Hill and effectively lobby for these changes? No matter how you get away with it, you know, there's gonna have to be some extensive lobbying going on. Uh, it, could that be one of those uh, specific actionable items that would advance this thing? 
Absolutely. And throughout history, uh, you've had people like, um, I think it was A.G. Gaston, and you had folks like Percy Sutton, very wealthy um, people of color who uh, chipped in, pitched in to make sure that the movement had the right financial resources behind it to be successful and viable. And to this day, now we have people like Jay-Z and Beyonce and various other individuals, you know, and it, it doesn't have to be rappers. It doesn't just have to, excuse me, it doesn't just have to be, you know, athletes who are, you know, the typical, the stereotypical sources of black wealth. It could be all kinds of individuals, you know, folks like Robert Smith who, who gave all of those scholarships to the, to the kids down at Morehouse. It can be all kinds of individuals. And it doesn't have to just be rich people, small, you know, people, you know, a, lo a lot of people giving a little bit can actually add up. And what I would say on this is your point is well taken that money is definitely relevant to, you know, getting your message out. You know, you look at Citizens United and, and how it affected the political process in terms of making money more of a, a factor in politics. And so I, absolutely, you know, and, I, and I'll just close on this question with this point. Um, you know, vision is great. And a lot of people have a lot of visions about a lot of different things. But vision without money, that's your loose. That's hallucination. <laughs> Uh, before I let you go, in terms of business and growth and development in your city, uh, what are some of the challenges that you face? And uh, if you were making a sales pitch for companies right now to look for a spot to uh, set up shop, if you will, why Greenbelt? Why now? Well, let me let me let me take let me separate out that question. So first, in terms of the challenges we face, I would say there are three big challenges that we face. Uh, one, coronavirus. Two coronavirus and three coronavirus. Uh, th this pandemic has had a devastating impact, not just on Greenbelt, but um, cities, counties, and states across this country on our health, literally our, our public health, on our economy, uh, on our well being, and, and really on the ordinary way of life uh, for our residents. And so I just want to acknowledge that the coronavirus pandemic is the biggest challenge we face economically. Um, for our city itself, but also for our private sector in terms of our businesses. It's affected revenues. It's caused some businesses to partially close and be on the verge or the brink of, of, of that, you know, uh, and I don't want to use the, the B word, but, you know, there are some businesses that are really contemplating uh, taking that step because, you know, the bills continue to come in, but the money's not coming in. Um, and then even on top of that, you, you mentioned like, you know, new, in, new, new investment in the city. A lot of that kind of is on hold because there's so much volatility in the market and because there's so much uncertainty about the future and folks don't really know how they're gonna make money in this environment. So I would say uh, those are some of the challenges. Um, as far as some of the strengths of our city, you know, we have a very vibrant community. I mean, not everything is quantitative. Um, I, would, I would encourage any business person to actually come to the city. Um, obviously I know money matters, but you know, we, we're, we're located very close to a lot of federal agencies, including NASA. Um, you got the University of Maryland College Park right there. Um, we have, you know, Beltway Plaza. We have, um, you know, a new community, Greenbelt Station coming in. I mean, some of this is kind of in the weeds in, in my backyard, but I'll just say, you know, we have some, uh, some real assets, including the Roosevelt Center. We have a historic district. Um, and, you know, Greenbelt, if you look at a PBS, if you look at PBS, Greenbelt is one of the 10 towns that changed America in terms of, you know, FDR and the New Deal. And there's, there's so much special and unique about Greenbelt. You know, my pitch isn't just to businesses. My pitch is also to people um, that this is a great place. And so, um, you know, we have challenges. I mean, one of the things that I want to focus on, I'll just mention two things that I think we, we want to focus on in terms of things that we want to bring in or attract, um, and that is senior housing, number one, uh, because we do have a, a growing aging population. We wanna make sure they can age in place, uh, relatively speaking, and also um, the quality of our restaurants. Um, we need to have higher quality restaurants in various parts of the city, and also restaurants that offer, he offer healthier options. Because again, we're in Prince George County where the diabetes rate is higher than it is in any other place in the country. And so we wanna make sure that we, um, you know, we don't have a food desert per se, but we want to make sure that we don't have a food swamp because that's just as bad. And I will close it out right here. As we approach the start of the school year, how confident are you that your schools in Greenbelt in particular, which is a part of a larger Prince George's County, you know, the biggest uh, school district in the state of Maryland, but in terms of Greenbelt itself, 
Uh, how confident are you that if you had to open as the Secretary of Education so uneloquently put on CNN, um, are you confident they could be safely open right now and, and, and the, the teachers and students would be 100% safe? Or are you sort of preparing right now for what seems to be the obvious that would be uh, off-campus learning until further notice? So let me just concede that as mayor of Wayne, but I don't have direct jurisdiction over this issue. Uh, it is, as you mentioned, uh, Prince George County uh, Public School System has jurisdiction over this as well as the Maryland State Department uh, of Education. Uh, I will say that I, I do not have confidence that we can physically reopen schools safely uh, for the 2020 to 2021 school year at this time. I, I will say that I, I disagree with, uh, very respectfully, with um, the Secretary of Education, Ms. Betsy DeVos, as well as the uh, current occupant of the Oval Office, who will remain unnamed. The reality is that I, I stand with our, our PTA, I stand with the Maryland State Education uh, Association, the Teachers Union in the state, uh, in, in saying that this next school year should probably be 100% uh, uh, online. Um, we have a, a, a quite a number of teachers in uh, this county and in this state um, who are in that high risk population. Um, they have those pre existing conditions. A lot of them are a lot older. Um, and then, you know, you compound that. I think this is affecting everybody, by the way. But then, you know, because this is the Afro, I would say you compound that with the fact that in Prince George County and in my city in particular, we have many black and brown families that are at particularly high risk because of existing and ongoing persistent healthcare disparities that make it so that they're more likely to get infected, more likely to experience the worst consequences of being infected, including um, death. And, um, you know, beyond that, you also have a lot, you know, with, with these populations, you also have a higher proportion of the students who actually use public transportation. And public transportation, of course, increases your risk of infection because you cannot socially distance the same way um, that you can, you know, if you're just with your family and, or with yourself in a car or something like that, or even walking outside. And so um, with all of those things in mind, I'm not comfortable with that move, but um, I'm hopeful that the uh, Prince George County Public School System, Maryland State Department of Education will see fit to um, allow everything to be virtual. Now, let me just say this. Um, there are economic intersectionality type of issues that are at play. So as we talk about going online for the long term, we need to make sure that we address that digital divide um, between the rich and the poor, between, in some cases, the black and the white, because the reality is at this point, we already know that there's an achievement gap. And if we don't address it soon, that achievement gap will become the achievement canyon. Colin Bird, at 27 years old, one of the more forward thinking executives in Maryland's political game, and I'm sure we're just watching the uh, start of something big. Mayor Bird, thanks for taking the time to join us, my friend. That, thank you so much, Mr. Gray. I appreciate it. And yeah, I like that's gonna, the saying about Gray. What's the, what is it? Something about Gray? What was it? You know, somewhere between black and white, there is that shade of gray. Hey, there <laughs> we go. Hey, that. That's fitting for these moments. All right. <laughs> It certainly is. So remember, anytime you want to speak, there's a role for you in the gray area. Absolutely. Likewise. Thank you so much. And thank you for hanging out with us as well. Remember, you can find me, Mark Gray. That's Mark with a K. Gray with an A all over the place in cyberspace, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And by all means, remember, maintain proper social distancing and mask up. Wash your hands, and most important, give somebody you love a hug tonight. You may not get a chance to do it tomorrow. Till next time, I'm Mark Gray, and as always, may you go in peace.